Um, this is our uh, review of groups and organizations. Uh, it is the, I think, the core of, of sociology. What we're we talking about when we're talking about sociology. Sociology is the study of people in groups, not psychology, not not individual motivations, not um, uh, um, not what people ought to do, but but groups basically. So what what do we mean by a group? Well, in this unit here, we're going to look at types of groups: primary and secondary groups, in groups and out groups, reference groups. How group size and structure affects both action and attitude. Uh, how size influences group dynamics, group conformity. Formal organizations and the different types of formal organizations. And the characteristics of bureaucracies. We talk a little bit about a concept that, that has been of some great salience in sociology. That's the concept of um, the McDonaldization of society, okay? And so your readings are going to be 115 to 132. Uh, so what are we talking about? Basically, a social group is a cluster of people with whom we interact in our daily lives. And I mean interact with some meaning here. We contrast that with a, a formal organization. It could be a bureaucracy, it could be a huge corporation, uh, you know, or it could be some other bureaucracy. The college you're going to is a bureaucracy, after all, okay? So, what is a social group? Well, at its root, it's two or more people who identify with one another. Groups contain people with shared experiences, loyalties, interests. Not every collection of individuals forms a group. Let me think about it for a moment. If you're in an elevator, right, uh, with people, you, you do everything possible, as we saw when we talked about uh, civil inattention and norms in, you know, in chapter three, uh, you know, there are times when we don't pay attention to people we're around, okay? But under the right circumstances, a, a, a group, a, a crowd can turn into a group. What do I mean by that? Well, say you're all in an elevator. You're not going to pay attention to people. It's just a happens to be a collection of people. If that elevator gets stuck, however, you're going to be right on it. You're going to turn into a group. You're going to figure out collectively how to get the elevator moving again. So there are two types, broadly, of social groups we want to talk about. A primary group uh, is a uh, small social group whose members share personal and lasting relationships. Your family, uh, the person you're involved with, uh, you know, you're married to, or is your spouse, or is your person you're having a relationship with. Uh, your, your, your siblings, your grandparents, parents, children, family members, friends. Contrast that with a secondary group. It's an impersonal social group whose members pursue a specific goal or activity. In other words, a primary group is its own reason for existing. Right? A secondary group, on the other hand, you know, is... is uh, pursuing a, a goal. This class that you're taking now is a secondary group, right? Um, a primary group is a group in which people spend a lot of time together. Let me move my little head down here. These personal and tightly integrated groups are among the first experience in life. That's our family. A member of a primary group think of their group as an end in itself rather than a means to an end. You're not going to look to your 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 uh, closest relationships to see 
what 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 kind of get out of them? Well, you do, but in, in a very um, ineffable way. You know, you're not looking. Um, members view each other as unique and irreplaceable. Much as you might not like your your family member, right? You know, but nevertheless, you know, they're still your family member. They're that 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 cousin of yours who you don't really like is still your cousin. Okay. So you know, irreplaceable. So a secondary relationship, by contrast, involves a weak emotional tie and little personal knowledge of the other folks in the group. Uh, and they include more people than do primary groups. You know, I mean, the passage of time can transform a group from a secondary to a primary group. Members don't necessarily think of themselves as we, as you might if you went to, you're going to your family reunion. You're thinking about we, my family, right? You're not thinking about your English class or your sociology class as we, okay? So primary groups, uh, um, display a personal orientation. They define each other according to who they are in terms of some ties, like family ties or personal qualities. A secondary group, by contrast, is, is a goal-oriented group. It looks to one another for what they are. What can they do for each other? And, you know, what can you do to get a grade in the class? What can you do to demonstrate to me understanding in the material? But the traits define the groups in ideal terms. Most real groups contain elements of both. Here's a little chart that explains orientation of personal versus goal, long-term versus short-term, uh, breadth of relationships, broad versus narrow, per per perception of relationships, ends in themselves, and uh, families or co-workers or political organizations or classmates. Now, a little bit about, gr about group conformity here. Groups profoundly influence the behavior of their members. They promote conformity. Solomon Ash and Stanley Milgram uh, had two uh, chilling examples of this. Ash, you know, uh, had an had a, a experiment that he did in a lab with people where he would pressure people into saying that two lines, which are the similar length, were different of different lengths, right? And most people would acquiesce to the pressure. Um, whereas Milgram, Stanley Milgram's experiment was scary. He had people um, who were actors sitting in chairs hooked up to what looked like electrodes. Of course, they, they were they were, they were were just, um, they weren't, right? Uh, and he told the people uh, who, uh, he put people who were the experimental subjects um, in control of a knob. And the knob went from zero to skull and crossbones, or dangerous, right? And, and there was a danger zone or a lethal zone or a red zone, you know, in the knob. It was an old school mob that you'd turn up, right? What he did, right, was he kept every, you were supposed to increase uh, the amount of, of, uh, of um, uh, shock that the, the person, the test subject was getting every time they gave a wrong answer. Well, the test subjects were actors. There was no electricity at all. And, and so what he wanted to see was the degree to which people would, would go, would, would, you know, could be convinced to give people, um, you know, over the red line, you know, a dangerous dose of, of, uh, of electric shock for a wrong answer. Of course, again, there was no electric shock, but the, the, the gist of the experiment was to see how, how much people would conform, um, and a lot of people did. There was some pushback, but a lot of people conformed. Um, you know, I mean, 
you, you know, again, here are the kind of gists of these two of these two uh, research projects, right? Um, now, an, another uh, classic view here uh, of of uh, group conformity is what's called groupthink. It's the tendency of group members to conform, right? Okay, let me give you three examples. In Vietnam, uh, the 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 people advising the president kept telling the president everything was going well. Well, it wasn't. And so they kept throwing more and more troops at the uh, at the situation. In the Bay of Pigs, the CIA convinced John F. Kennedy that they could invade Cuba and that the Cubans would support the invasion. Well, uh, it was uh, it was uh, ridiculous. They invaded with a small force, and they were immediately taken prisoner by the by the people of the Cubans. You know, who lived there. And of course, in Iraq, you know, we were told that there were, you know, people, these group think, um, we were told that um, not only were there weapons of mass destruction, but we could invade Iraq with a small force. And regardless of what one feels about the Iraq war, that was an example of group think, that the people who had knowledge and had counterpoints, uh, that was Colin, General Colin Powell, uh, who was advising the president, got squeezed out of the conversation. People who don't conform within, particularly these political elites, uh, tend to get squeezed out of the conversation. In 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 more authoritarian companies, they, they, they face, you know, getting killed. Okay. We also have something called a reference group. Okay. A reference group is a group, a social group that serves as a point of reference in making evaluations and decisions. Use it to assess our own attitudes and behavior. Um, you know, I mean, basically, uh, you know, a student group, a pre-professional group, you know, a sports fan club, all those are reference groups. We, uh, we align ourselves with. We don't make judgments about ourselves in isolation. We, co we don't compare ourselves with just anyone. In absolute terms, we form a subjective sense of our well-being by looking at ourselves relative to specific reference groups. Samuel Stouffer studied uh, two groups in the Army uh, at the end of World War II, a military police, and pilots. It was right. It was before 1947, before the Air Force became a separate branch. Um, military police, who were relatively stagnant and didn't get promoted too much, tended to be content because they compared themselves to other military police. Whereas fighter pilots, you know, who were uh, in the Army, what was then the Army Air Corps, and later became the Air Force. Uh, uh, g g generally tended to be um, have discontent because they were comparing their promotions to other people in the air in the in the air service, right? And who were getting promoted quickly, and you know, as as that was a rapidly developing sort of uh, element of the American military. Um. Another thing, uh, a characteristic of a group are in-groups and out-groups. An in-group is a group with we align ourselves with. We feel respect and loyalty. An out-group is a group that's uh, toward which a person feels a sense of competition or opposition. You know, in the most innocuous sense of the word, you know, we're talking about... Um, you know, we're talking about, like, sports fan groups. But in-groups and out-groups can be gangs. Uh, they can be entire nations with sometimes very dangerous uh, results. Um, tensions uh, between groups sharpen the group's boundaries and give people a clear social identity. Members of in-groups hold overly positive views of themselves and unfairly negative views 
of uh, out groups. Uh, you, you know, and powerful in groups can define others. You know, as a lower status out group. This happens. This, these are the mechanisms in, in terms of group. You know, uh, you know, of prejudice and discrimination. Um, group size has a has an effect. Group size plays a crucial role in how group members interact. Smallest group we have is a dyad. It's got two members. Uh, it's unstable. If one of the members withdraws, the group collapses. A triad is a group, a social group with three members. It's more stable than a dyad, and um, uh, it is uh, as groups grow beyond three people. They become more stable and capable of withstanding the loss of one or more members. Uh, and and base, basically, uh, it's based less on personal attachments and more on formal rules and regulations. As groups, uh, as the number of people in a group increases, the number of relationships that link to them increases much faster. By the time six or seven people share a conversation, the group usually divides into two. Why are relationships in smaller groups more intense? Well, th th this pretty much uh, provides uh, a good example of this. You know? Um, you know, I mean, each of these lines represents a possible interaction, okay? And... You know, as, as, as we uh, get beyond five people, it really becomes hard for everybody to, to, uh, to have a, a talk to talk, have a conversation. A network is a weak, a web of weak social ties expanding outward. Now we, we talk about our social web, but they, these predate the existence of Facebook and Instagram and other social medias. Um, they reach great distances, include large numbers of people. They're sort of like groups. More commonly includes people we know of or who know of us, but for whom we interact rarely. You know, and as social media emerges, you know, we're, we're having to think of new ways of looking at groups. You know, is this a group? Isn't it a group? A lot of this has to do with what's called boundary maintenance. Where are the boundaries of the group? Are they permeable? Are they vague? Or are they really tight? Network ties may be weak, but they can be a powerful resource. People's colleges, the clubs, neighborhoods, political parties, personal interests, people you know, people maybe from your church. So a privileged network is a valuable source of social capital. This is how many people find work, through social capital, through social connections, as it were. Now, uh, finally we get to, you know, we're going to spend a little bit of time here now talking about formal organizations. You're going to spend most of your work life in a formal organization. You're sitting in one now when you're in college. It's a large secondary group organized to achieve a goal efficiently, also called a bureaucracy. They're basically the same thing. Um, most of the task of organizing 300 million people in, in American U.S. society is, is done through formal organizations. And while formal organizations date back thousands of years, um, uh, you know, uh, they only came to fruition when we had a rational, efficient culture, a culture based on means to an end. I'll talk a little bit about that in class. Uh, a tradition is a value and belief passed from generation to generation.
Um, basically, tradition makes society conservatives. When we talk about rationality, and we'll talk about that just now for a minute, we're talking the most efficient way to accomplish a particular task. Think about your own education. How do you want to achieve it? That's rationality. You want to do it as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible, and as effectively. That means you want to graduate, you want to get pretty good grades as possible. Okay? So these are the three benchmarks of rationality. Inexpensive, quick, and effective. Okay? That's rationality. That is a rational, how we do it. Right? That's how we decide that this is done. Rationalization of society, you know, all society now is rational, and it's how we how we go about um, uh, organizing our society. So we can contrast a small group here with a formal organization. I'm going to direct you to this screen, um, and uh, have you you need to review this video and watch this. Um, uh, in some detail, but let's look at the characteristics of this formal organization or this bureaucracy. A bureaucracy is a model that's rationally de designed to perform tasks quickly, inexpensively, and effectively, or efficiency. Um, people officials or, or people who are incumbents, or you know, in, in this case, for example, you've got like student life, and and you've got professors and instructors. Right, regularly create and revise policy to increase efficiency. So there's six key elements of an ideal, and that means by ideal we mean, uh, you know, the best possible way of doing a bureaucratic organization. Specialization. Um, office, a hierarchy of offices. Or worker, workers are arranged in kind of a vertical ranking, you know, from the top to bottom. Rules and regulations. There are rationally enacted rules and regulations that guide operation. Technical competence. Officials have the technical competence to carry out duties. Um, new members are hired according to their uh, to set standards, and their performance is monitored. In personality, rules ahead of personal whim. Clients or, or customers or students or whatever and workers are treated the same. Finally, formal written communications. Formal, you know, I mean, I mean, bureaucracies depend on written rules and reports. Um, and bureaucracies carefully hire worker and limit unpredictable effects of personal taste and opinion. Right? All organizations, and this is one area that I uh, study, um, uh, exist in their uh, in an environment. Their their environment. The factors outside of an organization affect its operations. Technology. Economic and political trends. Current events. The available workforce and other organizations. You know, all of these affect an organization and its environment. Uh, technology shapes modern organizations in profound ways. If you don't um, keep up with technology, you know, you, you're going to, uh, you, you, to fail, right, if, if you're an organization. Um, and again, you know, organizations are, uh, you know, uh, affected various variably by economic growth or recession. Look at this pandemic. Um, as I say here, I'm making this video. It's September 2020. The pandemic, uh, some organizations are failing. Other organizations are becoming fabulously wealthy in terms of private capitalist organizations, right? Some schools are doing, are, are maintaining um, and, and moving ahead. 
uh, other schools like in universities and colleges are not doing so well, right? So, you know, that's it. Most industries also face competition, right? Um, also, uh, also uh, bureaucracies have an informal aspect, okay? Um, you know, I mean, we have to, we have to be flexible. Human beings are flexible. They're not, they don't follow rigid sets of, of, of axioms or rules. Bureaucracies have problems, though, okay? Um, they can, um, they can be, uh, dehumanizing. You can, bureaucratic alienation. Uh, you know, an organization has the potential uh, to dehumanize the people it serves. Impersonality fosters efficiency, also keeps officials and clients from responding to unique needs. Formal organizations create alienation, in other words. It, humans are reduced to a small cog in a ceaselessly moving mechanism. You know, I mean, while organizations are designed to benefit people, people might wind up benefiting the organization. There's bureaucratic in inefficiency and ritualism, what we call red tape. And, you know, this bureaucratic inertia. In other words, organizations are going to perpetuate themselves. There's no organization that's going to, that's going to go, okay, our work is done here, it's time to dissolve. Particularly if the organization's embedded in government. Um, I'll give you some examples when we talk in class. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, organizations are oligarchical. That means they're, they're kind of the rule of the many by the few. A few leaders are in charge of the resources of the entire organization, and we've seen what happens with that. Okay? We've seen what happens with that. We have CEOs that make 350 times the amount of money that their average worker, um, you know, makes. So bureaucracy is a top-down system, and there there are problems associated with it. Um, basically, scientific management, um, you know, is is one of the both sources of the effectiveness of an organization and of the potential alienating forces in an organization, both at the same time, where job performance is is uh, is observed, measured. Time is analyzed, um, and, and management is supposed to provide guidance to increase efficiency. Humans tend to resist this. So that's my brief overview of, uh, of uh, uh, groups and organizations. Organizations is a type of group. Thanks for watching.